Uh, Jack Whalen from the Office of the Chief State's Attorney, as well as Jack Bannon. And they're going to talk to all of you about how and what limitations the Chief State's Attorney's Office has with regards to helping law enforcement. Thank you, Lara. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jack Whalen. I'm a prosecutor at the Chief State's Attorney's Office, and along with me is Jack Bannon who was an inspector at the Chief State's Attorney's Office. And I must say, this is Laura's big day, because when, when she said about three hours ago that she called me once <laughs> to complain about the relationship between PSC and law enforcement, it was probably 10 times, maybe 15 times, but uh, good for her. She finally got us all together. Um, we used to have an elder abuse unit the Chief State's Attorney's Office, and actually Mr. Bannon was a inspector in that unit when, when it first originated, so he's going to tell you a little bit about the evolution of the unit and uh, maybe a little bit about its demise. Can, hear you. Sorry. Oh, Can you hear me? <laughs> um, in, on October 20, 2000, uh, I was hired as the loan inspector, and John DeMattia was hired as the loan prosecutor. Uh, to start an elder abuse unit in the state of Connecticut. Um, we were very successful, so successful that over the course of the next couple of years, the unit expanded to two prosecutors and five inspectors and one supervisory inspector. We were that busy. Uh, and then I think the grant money ran out. And that's when the unit ran out, about 2008, 2009. Um, the function that the elder abuse unit performed has now been absorbed by the unit that Jack supervises, uh, which is statewide prosecution. Uh, unfortunately, statewide prosecution also wears a lot of hats. We do conflict of interest cases from other judicial districts. Uh, white collar crime is our kind of our specialty. There's a lot of that. Uh, public corruption. When the elder abuse unit uh, was done and those, the folks in that unit were all reassigned, Laura used to continue to send me the, uh, the PSE uh, reports, which the social workers did, and um, they came through the email, and there were thousands and thousands of pages, <laughs> and we did our best to put them all together and refer them out to local police departments. Um, we did that for a few years, I think. Did, did that work out uh, did, fairly yeah. well? Yeah, we had, it, the social workers were telling me that they were getting calls from police departments about those cases. 
So the, the main thing in the, in the elder abuse cases is to find a contact at the local police department who's willing to work on these files. Uh, these are important cases, they are essential cases, and they do need to be investigated, but sometimes it was hard to find investigators who are willing to do them because they, they involve a lot of leg work and they're not quick and easy uh, shootings or burglaries or, or things like that. It involved a lot of work. Um, so for a while, she was forwarding those the social worker reports to me. I was parsing them out to the local police departments and, and we went with that. But then that came to an end when we suffered more uh, personnel shortages. So uh, we're here today because Jack and I both recommended to our boss that we need to get involved in this stuff again. And the only way we're going to do that is if we can increase our personnel. Um, that's probably the main reason why we came and we, we certainly hope it works out. But while the elder abuse unit was uh, up and running, um, there used to be this notion in Connecticut that if someone had a power of attorney or if somebody was a conservator, they could do whatever they wanted with somebody's assets. And we all know that's not true, but for a few years, that's the way it worked. Um, but we tried a case when the elder abuse unit was up and running. It's called State versus Kathleen Levine. And um, basically, Kathleen Levine was the niece of an elder who lived in New Hampshire. Um, she went up to visit her aunt one day and ended up emptying out all her bank accounts and moving her to Connecticut, where the niece bought a house using her aunt's money. She opened bank accounts in Connecticut while they were here. Somewhere along the line, uh, social services got involved and a conservator was appointed by the probate court. And the conservator noticed that uh, the aunt, whose first name was Matilda, right? Cleopatra. Cleopatra. <laughs> uh, she, her spending habits uh, changed dramatically when she got to Connecticut. She was pretty frugal up in New Hampshire, like, like most people in New Hampshire are. But when she came here, she bought that house. She was opening bank accounts and closing bank accounts and cashing in stock certificates and the like. So we charged Kathleen Levine, the niece, with five counts of, ten counts of larceny. And the long and the short of the case is, is that uh, that notion that joint bank accounts are, could be the property of the caregiver uh, is no longer true. Uh, the judge ruled in our favor with respect to one of the counts that was prosecuted. And it's now the law in, the Connecticut, in Connecticut that the proceed, the money in a joint bank account, uh, if it disappears, is a fact question for the jury. It's not a question of law for the court to decide. It goes beyond that, and it's up to the jury to decide whether or not the elder has been swindled out of his or her assets. Um, he was the inspector on the case, so he yeah, I mean.
Now, in, in that Levine case, uh, as I said earlier, the, the defendant, the niece, was charged with 10 different counts of larceny, and she was only convicted of one count. The other nine counts were mistried, and I don't think you would, you never went back and retried them, right? And that was only for $3,300, but at least in that instance, the judge got the message, and he actually, he actually threw the niece in jail for um, something suspended after six months of probation. So um, that, that's a good result for the state of Connecticut because, um, like I said, uh, years the notion was that uh, if you're the PLA or if you're the conservator and somebody has a joint account with your name on it, it's your money too, which isn't the case. It's um, about all we have. We're, like I said, we're on the outside looking in and we'd love to get involved again. So um, thank you for your attention. Before we announce our last guest, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of comments about probate court. Um, I did a lot of representation of the department in the probate courts around the state. And um, one thing that I did want to mention was that during the time period when I was sending um, Jack um, our case reports and saying, oh, I think there's a crime here, I think there's a crime here, if it was a really egregious case, and I had gotten the um, perpetrator to say a few things on the record that were flat out lies or pretty damning to them. I would automatically ask the probate clerk to make me a CD of that testimony in the probate hearing because a lot of times people think, oh, it's just probate court, it's not real court. Well, they made a, <laughs> they made a statement under oath and they flat out lie, and then you can use that inconsistency, you know, in Superior Court. And actually a case um, that um, did get prosecuted, we, we didn't end up getting to that point. I was really disappointed. Steve Sadensky of um, Danbury tried the case, and I was so disappointed when he told me that she pled out, because I was like, oh, I really wanted to hear all that. Because he said, you know, your questioning of her at the probate hearing provided me with information that was contradictory to something else, and he was going to present that. I was so devastated it didn't get to that point. <laughs> but, you know, that's another um, piece of evidence that might really be helpful, is that they may 
they may not take probate court for what it really is, which is a real court, and say something really damning. So that was one thing I wanted to say about probate court, and there was something else I wanted to say about it, and I can't remember what it was now. Um, I'm sure I'll think of it. Um, so our last guest is Christopher Gust. He's from the US Treasury Department. He agreed to come today, and I thank you for staying here all this time, <laughs> because you're the last presenter. And he's standing in, actually, for Heather Cherry, who's with the US Attorney's Office. She is the Elder Justice Coordinating co Coordinator for um, the U.S. District Attorney's Office in this area. Um, she couldn't make it today, so she asked Chris to take her place, and so um, I'd like you to welcome Chris. Thank you. 
Thank you. 